If you remember last week, we started talking about this subject, and I saw this emails, you know, publications, uh, blogs, emails started coming through again this past week about this subject. Is the local church dead? And we started down this path last week. And the answer, of course, is no. In fact, the local church is very much alive and thriving. You, you can't judge anything by numbers nowadays. The reason why this question is being raised is because so many people are apparently leaving the local church, have become disillusioned. Many people have been hurt by churches. And that's really one impetus for the teaching this morning. Uh, you know, it's kind of a strange title, the, the Rapture and Your Pastor. I want to show you what a pastor is supposed to be and what your relationship to a pastor is supposed to be and why that is so important for you being ready to be received by Jesus Christ. Why is that important for you to be ready to be raptured up, which is the next great event in the church that we're looking for and hoping for? All right, so is the local church dead? And, and no, it's not. But I put there in your notes, there's been a real destructive misunderstanding of why the church exists and how the church functions, and that leads to the decline of the local church. Um, nowadays, you know, why the church exists is, uh, is really misunderstood. Do we have an extra pair of set of notes for this young lady here? Maybe we ran out. Maybe I didn't make enough. Kevin is so spiritual and smart, he doesn't need notes, so he'll, he'll be fine. That's right. Yeah, he, are, he already knows it all, so... He's in good shape. Why the church exists? You know, I, there's so much nowadays where the church is trying to fit into this world. And I saw this, uh, it was on YouTube. And, you know, YouTube, this nation, this nation would be so much better without YouTube. You know, there's so much on YouTube that's just nothing but perversion and deception and delusion, but there are some good ministers on YouTube proclaiming the word. Thank God for that. But otherwise, it's this huge conglomeration of all of the philosophies and strategies of the world system and false religions and mysticism, and, and it's just this huge conglomeration, conglomeration of mess. But at any rate, I was, I was watching on YouTube this, um, this video clip of where Joel Osteen was being interviewed by uh, Pierce Morgan. Y'all know who he is? He used to be on CNN. And, uh, and I, you know, why the church exists, that there's so much emphasis today that the church has to be relevant to our culture and that the church has to embrace and be comfortable for anybody and everybody to come in. And we have to pack the church full of all of these people and make it seeker-friendly, make it user-friendly. And so in this interview, uh, Pierce Morgan asked Joel Osteen, do you believe that homosexuality is a sin? You know, homosexuality is the hot button nowadays. And so Joel Osteen said, yes, I believe, according to the scriptures, that homosexuality, same-sex marriage, is a sin. And then... Pierce Morgan, in a, uh, in a rather, I, I would have to call it a, a satanic genius, uh, really just started to tear down Joel Osteen's dogma bit by bit, and very systematically. And it came to the point, and he wasn't even really, he wasn't even vicious about it. it just, he just, but he just began to decimate Joel Osteen's dogma that Joel was trying to hold to, but eventually it came to, well, uh, Joel Osteen made this one statement in the, in the dialogue. He said, well, he said, you know, we have plenty of homosexuals in our church. And that should cause warning bells to go off in all of us when we consider 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5 lists, I believe it's six type of sins that should never be present in a church. One is fornication. 
I think the second is extortion. Uh, one is covetous, one is idolatry, and I don't think I can remember the others. But you get, you get the message. And Paul is saying there that if someone calls themselves a Christian but is involved in these sins and it's known, then you are to put that person out of the church because that type of sin is not allowed to remain in the church. Now, if the person is, is seeking God and if the person repents of their sin, that's a completely different story, isn't it? Then we love them, we embrace them, we help them to find their freedom from that sin in Jesus Christ. But if they continue to persist in the sin and there's a refusal to repent, then the Bible says that you have to purge out that leaven because sin like that spreads. And sin will corrupt us from the inside out and will prevent us from being ready for the Lord's return. And so when you have a pastor making a statement saying, oh, we have plenty of homosexuals in our church, you've got to think, did you read 1 Corinthians 5? Practicing homosexuals are not supposed to be in the church. They shouldn't be comfortable in the church. And one of the hardest, uh, I think one of the hardest jobs, at least it's one of the hardest jobs for me as a pastor, is having to tell people you need to find somewhere else to go to church. One of the most important jobs of the pastor is being that gatekeeper, being that protector of the flock to not let sin in whether it be a railer, 1 Corinthians 5, that's one of the other six, 1 Corinthians 5 being a railer, someone who brings accusation or criticism against others, uh, they're not to be allowed in your midst. And so one of the most difficult parts of being a pastor is, is being that protector of the flock to not allow these destructive sins in the church. And so Pierce Morgan went on in this interview and uh, he, he got, he asked this question. He said, well, you know, if, if a gay couple in your church uh, asked you to marry them, would you do it? No, I wouldn't do it because that's contrary to scripture. And then Pierce Morgan went down the line of, well, you know, uh, this, be, this is becoming more and more acceptable. More and more states are legalizing same-sex marriage. You know, what, what, What's going to be your stance then? What is the church going to do when, this, when the law of the land legalizes same-sex marriage? And we all know the answer to that, right? It doesn't matter what this nation legalizes. The word of God is the word of God. And, uh, and so he got, the, the next question beyond that was, well, what if a homosexual couple in your church asked you to attend their marriage? You don't have to marry them. You just attended the ceremony. And Joel Osteen said, well, yes, I would go. Out of respect for them, I would go to, to the gay marriage ceremony. And you can, you can see all along, and in one very strategic point in this discussion, Pierce Morgan said, you know, he was either talking to or interviewing the leader of Iran lately. And he said, you know, that the leader of Iran was... Uh, was um, boasting in a way to him that in Iran there's no homosexuals. And Pierce Morgan said to Joel, he said, you know, what you're saying is kind of scaring me because you're sounding like Iran. Now, do you, do you hear that? They're lumping conservative Christianity now with radical Islam and saying that we're just like them and that now we're scaring people because we sound just like them. But what happened was, you know, Joel Osteen's whole dogma began to be decimated, and he backed down off of the truth, and from the point of, well, no, I wouldn't marry them, but no, out of respect for them, I would go to their wedding ceremony. The truth is the truth, and one reason why the church exists, and this is why we have so many problems in the professed church today, the church is to be the pillar and the ground of truth. If there's truth nowhere else in the land, people are supposed to know where to go to find it, and it's supposed to be us, the church. And we are to preach it, we are to live it, we should be willing to live for it, and we should be willing to die for it. 
and that's why we exist. We exist, as we talked about last week, because Jesus is coming back for a bride without spot and without wrinkle. And we are to be ready to meet him when he comes for us in the clouds. Do you realize whether you live or whether you die, you're still going in the rapture? Because if you die, 1 Thessalonians says what? The dead in Christ will be raised first, and then those of us that remain that are alive will meet them in the air, in the clouds, and forever we will be with the Lord. So we are preparing for that one moment. We're not preparing for any purpose here on earth. We are not, the church is not here uh, to, um, to provide worldwide humanitarian aid, even though we believe in being good Samaritans and helping whenever and whenever we can and, and feeding the poor and, and helping the sick and visiting the prisoner. And we believe and we do all of that stuff, but that's not our reason for being here. That's not our primary purpose for existence. Our primary purpose of existence is that any moment Jesus is going to crack the sky, come in the clouds, call us home, and we have to be ready to meet him in the air. That's why we exist. And when the church starts to think that it exists for any other earthly or worldly purpose, that is when we get off track. We are not to be friends of this world. We are to be pilgrims and strangers in this world. We're not trying to get the world's approval. We are living for God's approval, period. And so we don't try to fit in because we know going in, part of the call of the Christian is knowing we don't fit in. We will be hated and persecuted. And it's only the delusion of the church in America that thinks that somehow we can fit into this world system. Thank God he has blessed our brothers and sisters in China and North Korea and in India and in Africa and in some of those other places. He has blessed them with being free from this temptation of trying to fit into the world because they taste of the hatred of the world, the persecution of the world. And they don't go through all of this thought process and, well, what if the church is no longer relevant to our culture? And we will never be relevant to this culture. We have answers. We can provide and show them the way of salvation and wholeness and healing and freedom from sin. We can show them the steps of righteousness and the path of holiness. We have a lot we can offer to them, but we will never love this world and we will never love the, the things of this world. We will always be aliens, foreigners, strangers. And so we have to understand why the church exists and we have to understand how the church functions. We went through this last week, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 24. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. And then this is why the church exists. This is why we come together in church services. This is why we are a church community and we love one another and encourage one another, that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be what? Holy and without blemish. That's why we exist. And every day we seek to be purified even more. We seek, be, seek to be separated from sin and separated unto God more and more every day so that when he comes back, we're ready to go home with him. So we don't exist for any worldly or earthly purpose. We are here to preach the gospel. We are here to reach the lost. We are here to show them the way of salvation. But our primary purpose, our primary passion is to be ready to be that glorious church and bride for our husband, for our Lord, Jesus Christ. So how do we get there? How do we become prepared? How do we, how do we become the church that Jesus wants us to be? It's all going to be done by relationship. And again, these are some areas we talked about last week. This is still review, and I need to hurry up here and get out of review. But the church does not function by legislation, by rules and bylaws. The church does not function by human administration. Although, thank God for people who can organize and put things together and make things happen. We need that. That is actually one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 
But yet that's not how the church functions. That's not the life of the church. That's not the heartbeat of the church. The church uh, does not function by dictatorship or democracy. The church functions by relationship. All right? The pastor is in charge of a local assembly, and he does make the decisions. But it's not a dictatorship, but it's also not a democracy. He operates, uh, if he's a wise pastor, he'll surround himself with spiritual leaders of like mindedness, like faith, and he receives counsel from the multitude of counselors, and that's how decisions are made. But it's not the world's way. We don't operate anything like the world system. The church does not operate by business and marketing strategies. Boy, that happens so much today. You know, I, I just, it just boggles the mind why as part of the living body and church of Jesus Christ, why would you go to the world for, your, for a marketing strategy? It, it's uh, it, human ambition, selfish ambition is the bottom line. You want more people, you want more money, you want more attention, but we don't go to the world. Jesus Christ adds to the church such as should be saved. Not your advertising agency. You know, we, uh, so much of what we see in churches today, they, they want to create a customer experience. You know, almost like a Starbucks or your favorite restaurant or you know, we want to create a certain experience when people walk in. We're here to experience God. We're here to encounter God. We're here to be taught by his word. And so we don't need all of the frills and the thrills and the sensationalism and all of the experiences. We just want God. We want to know the truth. We don't have great outreach campaigns where we try to, you know, drive the people in in droves and even though we do preach the gospel and we reach out to our neighborhoods and we, we invite our neighbors and our coworkers to church and we tell them about Jesus, but we're not here just to pack people in and to get them here no matter what it takes. We're here to hold up the standard of truth. And if the Holy Spirit is drawing their heart, they will come. The church does not function by social media or media ministry. The church does not function by programs and activities. Although, once again, there's nothing wrong with programs and activities and organizing events. There's nothing wrong with using social media or media ministry. We do here at Westgate Chapel. But that's not how the church functions. The church functions by relationship. And without those relationships, you and I won't be ready to meet the Lord. Like I pointed out last week, there in Ephesians, it says that he might present it to himself a glorious what? a glorious church. Jesus Christ is coming back for you individually, and individually you will answer to him. But Jesus Christ is also coming back for a church. So he's not coming back just for a grab bag of individuals. You will answer to him as an individual, and you will answer to God as a member of the body. So you will answer to him on two different levels, and you'll see this. This is one point of today's message. You will answer to him individually, and you will answer to him corporately. You will answer to him according to what you have said and done in your life, and you will answer to him according to how you fit into relationship with his body. Because he's not coming back for a bunch of individuals. He's coming back for a what? A church. So are you in that church? Are you relating to that church the way you're supposed to? Are you a part and in unity with that church the way you're supposed to be? And so, so those are some of the things we want to consider and ask as we go through this. Let me jump ahead through some of these. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And you're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And so he's talking about the church here, the body of Christ. And as we gather here this morning in his name, we are a subset. We are a part of that church. So your experience here this morning, being here in worship, being taught the word of God, focusing on Jesus, this is how you participate 
in the universal church of Jesus Christ. This is how we are supposed to function, verse 21, in whom all the building fitly framed together. Remember what that word means, fitly framed. We are to be joined closely together. You know, I, I, there's an underlying statement, and I don't want to get too far off on this, but in 1 Corinthians 5, once again, where he says that if there be any among you who are living these lifestyles, they are to be put out of the church. Do you realize that puts a size limitation on the church? What does that mean? That means that you have to be intimate enough with the people there in that community that you've gotten to know their lifestyle. Well, there's only, remember last week we talked about the fact that Jesus kept his 12 disciples small. He's kept it a small group. He kept it an intimate group. If you start to get bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, the pastor is supposed to know the members, to be able, according to 1 Corinthians 5, control who comes and goes, and the bigger you get, you lose all of that perspective. The bigger you get, you don't know who's coming in and who's going out. But there's supposed to be a gatekeeper. There's supposed to be a filter. And Paul reproves the Corinthians and says, why haven't you put this person out yet? Because this sin will spread and kill you from within if you don't resolve this. And so the fact that he was reproving them, that this was known, they, they knew this person, they knew their, this lifestyle, they were closely knit together, but they weren't doing anything about the problem. And so it kind of gives you a gauge for how small we're supposed to be, how big we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be that, that intimacy, that knowing of one another can never be lost in the growth process. Not that there's any certain number that's attached to it. Not that there's anything wrong or sinful about larger churches. But lives and hearts better be known. And I think that's why a lot of people are leaving the local church, because they don't want to be known. They're not willing for that vulnerability. They're not willing for that accountability. But this is what the Lord orders, that we are fitly framed together, and as we are fitly framed together, there's going to be life and nutrition and nourishment that flows one to another, and we grow unto a holy temple in the Lord. So these relationships are to be close-knit. These relationships are to be where we know one another. We fellowship with each other throughout the week. We're praying for one another. When there's sin that arises in our midst, it's taken care of, it's dealt with. And hopefully there's repentance and restoration that takes place. But it all works off of relationships this knowledge of one another, the intimacy of being fitly framed together. Now, I'm going to skip over a lot of this, and let's just talk about what we want to talk about today. What role is the pastor supposed to have in your life? And how does the role of the pastor prepare you to be accepted by the Lord on that day when he comes for us? John chapter 17 you could call this, in a sense, Jesus' last prayer. It's his last prayer in solitude, in peace, right before he's going to be arrested and stay in trial. And so I've, I've just taken an ex excerpt out of the whole prayer, but this prayer brings to us some startling, startling statements about the church. And I want you to really see it and understand it for what it says this morning. Verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men. And I took some, uh, you know, some liberties with color in your notes and highlighted some portions. In these verses, in these six verses from verse 6 through 12, it's either five or six times Jesus repeats the phrase, those which thou gavest me. And he's referring to the 12. And so we start to see right there what is church? Who comes to church? How is church? How is the community established? It's established with those that God gives us. 
In other words, it's not supposed to be a thing of where we open the doors and make everyone feel comfortable and come one, come all, and we accept all kinds no matter who you are or what sin you're involved in or what lifestyle or no matter what gods you worship, just come one, come all. No, it's God is going to bring and call specific ones to specific fellowships. Doesn't 1 Corinthians say that he places us in the body as he wills? So he's going to place some here in this church. He's going to place some in the church down the street. He's going to place some in the church in the next county. He's going to place some in the church in the next state. And he's going to distribute members into the fellowships, into the communities of believers as he sees fit. He says, I've manifest thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. See that? Out of the world, not a part of the world, not loving the world, not trying to embrace the world, but those that God gives out of the world, thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came from thee, and they have believed that thou didst what? Send me. You know, verse 8 is describing what the world used to call a marriage made in heaven. You all heard that phrase, that expression in the past? And a church is really supposed to be a marriage made in heaven. God calls a pastor, God sends a pastor, but he also calls and sends the congregation. And it's a mutual meeting of God's call. And we're going to see this in Corinthians when we get over there. I pray for them. I pray not for the world. Some people would have a lot of trouble with that statement. I'm not praying for the world. Now, is it wrong to pray for the world? Absolutely not. Is it wrong to pray for the unsaved? Absolutely. Keep praying for them. They need it. But this is Jesus' climatic prayer at the end of his ministry and his primary priority was the church, his disciples, and the birth of the church. So that's what this prayer is all about. I pray not for the world, but I pray for them which thou hast what? You know, it, it's almost as if Jesus knew that here in 2015 we would be eavesdropping on his prayer and he wanted us to get the point those which thou hast given me. I'm going to bring to the church and set in communities around the world those that God gives, those that God brings, those that God ordains. It's not up to your marketing strategies. It's not up, with, up, up to how well you stay relevant to the culture. What is the bottom line here? What is the impetus for people joining themselves to our fellowship? Those that God gives us. All mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thy own name those who what? Keeps repeating this over and over again, doesn't he? I think he wants us to understand this point, this principle, whom God gives to us. That they may be what? One, again, that speaks to the intimacy that we are supposed to have as a fellowship, right? We are supposed to be as one. We are to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, harmonious relationships. While I was with them in the world, I kept them through thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I kept, and none of them is lost. So the fact of church life is this. God is going to call certain ones to this fellowship. It's our job to keep them and make sure they don't become lost. That's my job as pastor. That's your job as another member in the body of Christ. To keep those so that they are not lost. To keep those that God sends to us. Because he will position and he will direct 
those in the body of Christ as he sees fit. So you're not here this morning by accident. You're here a part of this body by divine appointment. Now let's go on and see how does this function, how does this work in a practical sense. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul sheds some great light on this, and I want you to see this in context with John 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 13, how is it that we come together? Because we've had a lot of people come into this fellowship and then leave this fellowship. Sometimes they visit once, sometimes they stay for a little while and then leave. What's up with that? What happens with that? It doesn't mean that they are not a Christian. It doesn't mean that they are not sin, that they are in sin. It doesn't mean that they're carnal. It doesn't mean any of that. It, those may be some reasons for sure. But there's nothing wrong with coming into a fellowship like this and figuring out, you know, I don't fit here. God wants me somewhere else. Nothing wrong with that at all. But watch what he says here in verse 13. How do you know where you fit? How do you find the church community that you're supposed to be in? He says here in verse 13, for we write none other things unto you than what you read or what? Acknowledge. And that's a key point right there. That that word acknowledge is from the word epikonosko. And we know that genosko or gnosis is the word for knowledge, right? And that word epigenosko means to recognize. Is, is one of its primary meanings. And so what it means is this. You come into a church service like this. You start to get to know me, the pastor, or you start to get to know others in this community. And you start to hear a certain message, and you start to hear a certain spirit. And you recognize that message. You recognize that spirit. And you say, you know what? That sounds like the Jesus that talks to me in my prayer closet at home. That's the voice that I've been listening to. This this is the right place for me because I recognize and I acknowledge what's being said. I think the biggest problem with a lot of Christians today is that they stay in churches even though in their heart they know something's wrong. They stay in a church, they keep listening to a message over and over again, and something, I know I did for years, and something starts churning over and over. That's not right. That doesn't sound right. That that doesn't sound the way Jesus would act or talk. That doesn't seem to agree with the scriptures. That's not what the Holy Spirit has been speaking to my heart. And in that case, you can't recognize or acknowledge what's being said, so you know that's not my church home. I need to find a place where I can acknowledge and recognize by the Spirit of God, bearing witness with my spirit, I need to be able to acknowledge and recognize what's being said as truth. And that's where I need to be as a member of the universal body of Christ. He said, for we write none other things unto you than what you read or acknowledge, and I trust you shall acknowledge those things even to the what? Even to the end. It's as if Paul is acknowledging there, you know, things do change. Sometimes God takes you on a different course or a different path. or Sometimes you actually grow beyond the spiritual understanding of that local fellowship. Sometimes, tragically, uh, a ministry starts off great and then it veers off track. And when it veers off track and the spirit inside of you starts to say, warning, 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 then it's time to leave and go find where you can acknowledge what's being said. But see, the attraction, the magnet, the adhesive that glues you into a local fellowship is when you can hear what's being said, you can sense the spirit that's being lived, and you can say, I acknowledge that, I recognize that, I agree with that. That's where I need to be. So you're placed in the body of Christ by that by that uh, witness of the Holy Spirit in your heart. Verse 14 is something we'll come back to, but he says, as also you have acknowledged us in part. And remember, uh, there was great division in the Corinthian church. That's why he says in part there. He's saying the core, those of you who are there from the start, from the very beginning, you know, you know our heart, you know our spirit, but there are those that have come in 
and are spreading dissension and division. But he says, you know that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, I don't want to get off on that quite yet. We'll talk about that in a moment. But look at verse 21 as we go farther down in the passage. Now, he which established us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is who? All right. Verse 21 makes it very clear you are in the local fellowship that you are supposed to be in by divine appointment. He that established us with you is God. You can't go shopping for a church like you shop for a restaurant. Going to church is not like going to your favorite store. You find the church where God has established you to be, where God confirms you to be by the mutual bearing witness of the Holy Spirit within you. He which established us with you is Christ, and he which hath anointed us to minister to you is God, who also hath sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul that I spare you. I came not as yet unto Corinth. And here you have to get to know a little bit of the background. Notice which letter this is to the Corinthians. It's the second letter. Remember, in 1 Corinthians, he had to scold them and get after them. And he's going to go on here and, and say in chapter 2, you know, I decided not to come to you because I didn't want to come and have to scold you again. But look at what he says here. He really sets the limits and the guides for spiritual leadership. Not for that we have dominion over your faith. And we see this time and time again in the scriptures. Any spiritual leader who in the name of God or in the name of the word of God takes the place of Jesus in your heart or life, you need to flee from them. Do I need to say it again? He said, we are not here as pastors and leaders to have dominion over your faith. And yet, I mean, it is rampant. It has been rampant for generations and centuries now, uh, probably starting most infamously with the Catholic Church, to where men have always tried to creep into your faith and say, you need me to get to God. I have special revelation to give you that you can't get on your own without me. And you need me to tell you certain decisions to make. And you can't make any decisions without my approval. And they start down that path of having dominion over your faith. And as a pastor, I am never to have dominion over your faith. You are to operate you and Jesus being discipled by Jesus, learning at the feet of Jesus, learning how to listen to his voice. Hebrews chapter 8 makes it very clear, quoting from the Old Testament prophecy, you will not go to a man who tells you know the Lord because he says all shall know me from the least to the greatest. I do not have special access to God that you don't have. I don't have extra revelation from God that you don't have. You have the same access, the same illumination by the Holy Spirit. And I will be damned if I step in on the Lordship of Jesus Christ in your life and try to assume control over you. He said, we are not here to have dominion over your faith, but we are here as what? Helpers of your joy. So I'm not here to boss you around. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm not here as Mr. Fix-It. You know, surprising enough, as it may sound at times, because I, I know sometimes how we put people on a pedestal, I have just as many problems, probably more than you. I struggle with the same temptations, the same sins that you do. I am not a special case. I am not the spiritual elite. I am not a special person in and of myself. I'm not Mr. Fix-It. I can't. I won't even try to solve your problems, but I will be here to help you. 
And I will be here to say you don't have to go through this alone. Because the Bible says two are better than one. And if you fall, I'm going to pick you up. And if I fall, I expect you to pick me up. And so many times that helper is just what you need to make the next mile. That helper will get you over the next mountaintop that you have to climb. It's just the encouragement. It's just knowing that someone is there. It's just so knowing that someone is on your side rooting for you who won't let you give up, who is there to give you that word of encouragement and comfort when you need it. And so he says here, we come together as a local church by divine appointment. The pastor is called and the people are called and it's a divine appointment, yet the pastor is never in a position of ruling over your faith or dominating your faith, but he's there as a servant to you. He's there as a helper to you. Jesus made it very clear to his disciples. He said, the Gentiles rule over one another, but it won't be so in the church. It won't be so among you. You're going to be servants to one another instead. The world governs itself through authoritarian methods, but not the church. So that's a very worldly method to try to run the church, but we don't operate that way. We operate by relationship. We operate by service and love one to another. So verse 24, he sets some very important parameters for us. And we're running out of time, so I, this, some of these verses, I don't want to go through these verses right now. I want to get to 1 Thessalonians. Uh, so let's get, uh, let's, let's start here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, because we have just enough time to go through this passage. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord not only in Macedonia and Acacia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad so that we need not speak anything. All right, so here's, here's the Apostle Paul. Location has changed. He's now speaking to the church in Thessalonica. He's no longer speaking to the church in Corinth. And he's saying that when these people became saved, there was a great testimony and a great miracle that was worked. Verse 9, for they themselves show of us what manner of entering we had in unto you. Okay, so he, he's basically stating this. How do we know that we had an impact on your life? How effective was the church? How successful was the ministry? He's going to tell you how to know. You turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And so he's saying, you guys really changed. You no longer worshipped pagan gods, but your heart turned and now you worship the one true living God. You serve him. You live for him. And then in verse 10, again, we see this time after time after time. One of the signs that this church was successful in God is that they are now waiting for his son from heaven. That's what we're doing. That's why we're here. We are here to wait for Jesus from heaven, and our job is to encourage one another on a daily basis not to give up. Because we can be distracted by the world system. We can be discouraged by the trials. We can get off course so easily. And we are here to protect one another and say, get back on track, get back on the course. Don't let that distract you. Don't let that get you down. Don't give up. Keep waiting for Jesus to come back from heaven. That's why we're here as a church. Going on in chapter 2, verse 1, For you yourselves, brethren, know our entrance unto you, that it was not in vain. For even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. So from Philippi, where there was heavy persecution, they roll into Thessalonica. Verse 3, for our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. All right, so he's talking about the purity of the motives of ministry. And this is something that I need to be very concerned with, and you need to be concerned about it as well. But this is primarily my responsibility that my exhortation, my ministry to you all is never one of deceit. 
and I put there in your notes what we're talking about, false teachers alter the truth. There's always truth in there because the truth is the bait. You know, this, this person quotes scripture, seems like what they're saying sounds right, but they're altering the truth, they're slaining it to a certain way to deceive you. Why do they do it? Why do they use deceit in their message and in their ministry? Because of uncleanness in their heart. They have a, they have a selfish motive, a selfish ambition. For some pastors, you know, it's the, it's the prospect of money. I want my che paycheck. I want money. I don't want, to, you know, I don't want to have to cut back. For some pastors, it's just the power of having everybody look at him. He wants that attention. He wants that ego stroked. So there's lots of selfish ambition that can creep into a pastor's heart. But Paul is saying we managed to stay clear of all of those impure motives. We didn't change the message at all. We didn't have any hidden motives of uncleanness. We didn't guile you with bait to tell you what you wanted to hear or to tell you something that would maneuver or manipulate you. Lots of ways to manipulate people, and we've talked about that in the past. You can use flattery to manipulate people. You can use intimidation to manipulate people. You can use condemnation or guilt to manipulate people. You can use peer pressure to manipulate people. A, a lot of devices of manipulation that, are, that would fall into that category of bait, guile. All because there was an impure motive in the pastor's heart. And so he used deceit in how the truth was presented. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but pleasing who? God. So the pastor you want to look for is a man that's not concerned about pleasing men, but pleasing God and God alone. And I can tell you from personal experience, that's, that's, a, hard, that's a hard place to come to. It, it's very hard on anybody to see people walk out the door. It doesn't feel good. It's not pleasant. But you have to surrender it to the Lord and say, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Father, whoever you want, that's what I want. Whoever you don't want, that's who I don't want. And Father, this is in your hands, and so whoever comes and stays is up to you, and I surrender that to you. So you have to find someone who's willing to speak the word of God and not compromise the word of God, even though it may cost you attendance and cost you members. It has to be someone that understands God is going to try my heart. And when I minister... I better minister the pure word of God without adding to or taking from. Five, for neither at any time used we flattering words. You know, uh, <laughs> you know sometimes you might say something sweet or, or nice to your spouse, and your wife might tell you, well, you know, flattery will get you everywhere. Ever heard that expression? And it's because when someone's flattering you, and flattering is different than encouragement, and the difference between flattery and encouragement is in the motive. It's just like, you know, uh, how can I say this? The, the difference between care and gossip is all in the motive. If you truly are concerned for someone and sharing a need and requesting prayer, uh, that's not necessarily gossip, but if you're sharing information to put them in a bad light or to present yourself in any way as being superior, now that turns into gossip. And with flattery, there's nothing wrong. We're supposed to encourage one another. We need to encourage one another much more than we do, but there's, uh, the difference between flattery and encouragement is the motive, and the motive of flattery is I'm trying to stroke your ego to make it real hard for you to tell me no. I'm, I'm going to, I mean, because everybody loves praise, right? Everybody loves compliments. And so the more I pour it on, I know the harder it's going to be for you to resist me. 
So he said, we didn't do that to you. We didn't pour on flattering words to manipulate you to embrace us. Nor did we use a cook of covetousness. You know, some pastor, some pastors, uh, they see people, and they see people as dollar signs. And the more people, the more money. And he says, but we were not using this as a way of getting money out of you. Nor of men sought we glory. A lot of pastors fall into uh, that narcissistic deception. You know, narcissism, you know the, the, uh, where the word narcissism comes from? It probably originated in Latin or Greek, I, I don't know which. But a narcissist is someone, in the original meaning, they look in a mirror and fall in love with themselves. Now, most of us would chuckle because when we look in the mirror, we don't fall in love with ourselves, right? We think, oh my gosh, have I deteriorated that far, right? But a narcissist is someone that is just so convinced of their own importance and so convinced of their own greatness. And narcissists will always surround themselves with people who sing their praises, because they've got, they're addicted to that flattery. They're addicted to that praise. They can't live without it. They have to be told how great they are continually. And Paul says that's a trap of being a leader. That's a trap of being in front of people. And we kept ourselves safe from that trap. We didn't seek glory of men. Neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. He's saying, we could have rolled into town and said, look, we are apostles. We deserve this from you. But he said, we didn't do that. I got to move on. Verse 7, but we were gentle among you. Don't, don't hang around a pastor who's not gentle. Find a pastor who is mild and kind, not someone who is brash or critical or quick to temper or quick to impatience, someone who treats you gently, even as a nurse cherishes her children. You know how careful women are with their babies? I, I went through two children, and still to this day, if I go to pick up a grandchild of mine, Terry says, hold his neck, hold his neck. You know, as if I've, now to me it's like riding a bike, you know, you, you don't forget to support the neck, but that's how careful a nurse is with an infant. They want to make sure you don't drop them, they want to make sure you support the neck, and you think, I've been around this barn more than once, I think I know what I'm doing, but that's how mom is, right? Moms would die for their children. And that's what he's talking about here. The role of a pastor in your life is to be as gentle as a nurse fostering her children. You need to find a pastor like that. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls. You need a pastor that loves you for who you are and is willing to give himself to you. Some pastors, all they're concerned about is with, is with filling the chairs and having somebody to listen to them, to listen to their great orator abilities, to listen to their great preaching or teaching, to tell them how great they are and how their teaching changed their life and Find someone who really cares about you as a person, who doesn't just see you as a dollar sign or doesn't see you as a body to fill a seat. Find someone who takes the time to actually look after you personally and individually. One of the best uh, kind of pictures of a pastor that I heard one time, this pastor was describing how a shepherd will go among his sheep and the pastor, the, the shepherd will 
you know, check underneath the belly to make sure there's no parasites or bites or injuries. It will check each leg. It will check, check the hoofs and the feet to make sure there's no splinters, to make sure that nothing's cracked or bleeding. Or... And so the shepherd will very tenderly look over each sheep and he will know, you know, this one's been bloated lately and a little bit slow, dragging their wagon. This one's got a cracked hoof and is therefore needs a little bit extra care and attention. This one, you know, gets distracted easily and wanders off, and so I've got to keep my eye on them. The shepherd knows the individual needs and cares of each sheep. And that's what he's talking about here, talking about someone who loves you enough to reach out to you and spend time with you. If you, if you watch any of the old movies, black and white movies from the 1930s or 1940s, have you see how, do you see how the community pastor often is depicted? To where they have church on Sunday, but you know what that pastor does Monday through Friday? You know, he, he, every day he would go around and he'd visit this farm and visit this home, and then he'd meet up with three or four of the guys at the soda fountain and have a soda. I'm sure it was chocolate ice cream soda, you know, but that's the way the pastor in a small town used to operate, and I believe that in a lot of ways, uh, not that we follow Hollywood or anything like that, but I believe that that's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, the pastor's responsibility goes far beyond teaching. The pastor's responsibility goes far beyond that into reaching into the homes and lives and hearts of the congregants and finding out where they are, finding out what they need, letting them know that I'm not here to dominate your faith, but I'm here to help you in any way that I can. You don't have to go through life alone. We're going through this together. And so you need to find a pastor who is willing to not only impart to you the gospel only, but someone who's willing to impart to you their own soul their time, their care. They don't just give you a pretty message on Sunday, but they give you their heart 24-7. They're with you. They're praying for you. Why? Because you were dear unto us. Find a pastor that likes you. Find a pastor that loves you. Don't hang around someone who you inconvenience. Don't hang around someone who perceives you as an interruption. Find a pastor who is focused upon you and your care. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring day and night, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. And he's talking about the fact here that in Thessalonica and in Corinth, remember, Paul made tents to earn a living. And so you need to find a pastor who's willing to bear the weight of ministering to you that doesn't put it all off on you. That doesn't say, you carry me. The pastor is someone that says, I'm here to carry you. And you are witnesses in God also how holy and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. And we're really out of time. So... We'll pick this up here, I think, next Sunday morning so that we can watch the video tonight. But I think next Sunday we'll start here in this 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 passage and we'll review what we covered and then we'll finish up here because I don't, I don't want to rush through 10, 11, uh, 12, and 13 because they're too important. All right, so this will be part one. Next Sunday morning will be part two. Father, we thank you for your word to us. And Father, we thank you that we're here by divine appointment. You, you call a pastor and you call a people. And it is a match made in heaven. And so Father, teach us to find where we are supposed to be. And help us to find the pastor, the shepherd, that you have ordained to care for our souls. Because the care of the pastor is very instrumental in making each of us ready to be received by Jesus Christ one day. And so, Father, we ask that you would lead and guide our steps. 
We pray, Father, that we would not be infatuated with large numbers or numeric growth or more money or we pray that the purpose of the church would be a strong conviction in our heart and that we would trust and rest in the fact that you will bring whoever is supposed to be added and those that you give us we are to keep and encourage and to lose not even one. And from the base of that healthy communal living, we are to reach out and preach this gospel to the lost. Father, teach us your priority and teach us your order in these things. In Jesus' name, amen.